Let's see if I can get this crisp on bike. Nice. And we're gonna have an uh, interruption in approximately five minutes when Mango, having finished his dinner and swollen roughly to the size of a tennis ball in the middle, jumps over the baby gate that we have keeping his laundry feeding space away from Owen. Once he has done that, we have to put the fucking cone back on him because the little shit keeps licking himself raw. <laughs> His fur, that is. <laughs> yes. I'm the good Christian podcaster, so I, I feel like it's against God's will. Look, if God had intended for cats to do autofellatio, he wouldn't have put hooks on their tongues. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Hello, why. and welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a podcast about statistics, with drawings, and apparently cat facts. Does that mean that, that it's intended for humans because we don't have hooks on our tongues? I was going to leave that unstated as part of the joke, actually. I was just thinking about it. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to participate in today's recording. I have some science to be. <laughs> I believe it took Tom Walker four days to fail it, so, you know. <laughs> four days to fail. <laughs> he claims he never succeeded, I think. Anyway, here on Statistically Insignificant, we talk about statistics. Today, we are talking about categories of fatness and definitions of fatness. I had a whole, like, scenario set up where I would be in a doctor's office being refused care for being fat, and then Bart would be, like, on his bike doing a mail run as well, but we got distracted talking about cats. Fatigories. Fatigories, yes, as they are broadly termed by fat people, not necessarily by the medical establishment, who desperately wants to use any term other than fat for us. As you might imagine from the topic, there is a content warning associated with this one, so we are going to be talking about weight, Obesity, fat phobia, medical discrimination, other forms of violence against fat people. Also, diets and weight loss are going to come up, so if you're not comfortable with that for the reasons of violence against fat people in your history, do not feel like you're obligated to listen to this. Remain subscribed to the Patreon. Yes, absolutely. Subscribe to our Patreon regardless. Patreon.com slash statistically insignificant. Yeah, uh, regardless of your attitude. If you're not going to listen to this one, subscribe. If you are going to listen to this one, subscribe. Exactly. The cat. Get the cat. The he, cat emerges. The cat has a. <laughs> the cat has escaped the box. I'm also going to make a, a note on language here, which is I use the term fat as a description of a body, as a description of physiology. It is not a moral statement. It is not an insult. It is just a description. Otherwise, you end up talking in a whole bunch of euphemisms. And... Yeah, like overweight. I'm making air quotes, and we will come to overweight and things when the reality is what you mean is fat, and you're just trying to be polite about it because you think fat is an insult. As, as you might imagine from what I've already said, I am in fact a fat person. Uh, I've lived with body shaming for a very, very long time. I don't hate my body now, I quite like my body, but I have had that experience in the past. First of all, we are going to talk about categories of fatness as used by the medical establishment and as defined by the medical establishment. Could I maybe ask a question? I don't know if you're going to cover this later, but why might there be an interest in categorizing fatness in general. For one thing, it is a thing that gets categorized and measured. For two, and we will actually talk a bit about this, there are relationships with fatness and some negative health outcomes. Right. Not nearly as many as we have been told, and the relationship is not nearly as straightforward as people seem to think, but it is a category of human physiology that does, in fact, impact both health and it also, from the perspective of fat people, it greatly affects how we interact with the world, because this is a world that is not built for us, and particularly for extremely fat people, is actively built to that in a manner that does harm to them. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to start with that, because I... No, that's fair. Before we launch into sort of how people are measuring it, I'm always wondering, why are they doing that? Why are they yeah. writing this down? <laughs> so there's, there's a bunch of different things, but like, people existing in the world is a matter of body size. Medical categories are categories imposed upon people's bodies. They are not typically chosen by people, and we will get later on to categories of fatness that have been kind of determined and discussed and are used by fat people to describe ourselves. In general, in the medical terms, we have weight-based categories, and specifically, much of the terminology comes from that. Well, it's one of the most common points of reference. You know, you stand on a scale, you see if it's gone up, you see if it's gone down. And yeah. it generally relates to, like, do I fit in my pants? Well, yeah. So the, um, the measurement system, your weight and your height are the typical ones used as a metric for overall body size and as a metric for fatness. Right, yeah. I'm sure we'll talk about BMI, where that comes from. Oh, that's going to be the focus, actually. So these become proxies 
for fatness. Weight in particular is what I would call a one-dimensional metric, right? It only measures one thing, one number. Yes. And so that is not particularly representative of human experience, right? Because your weight, even in a very literal sense, your weight does not define your body size because you can have bodies that are of different density, bodies that are of different height. And this is why we come to BMI as my greatest foe uh, in this sort of spectrum, but also the most common proxy metric for fatness. If somehow you have escaped the definition of BMI, I'm just going to write it down here. So your body mass index, as it is known, is equal to your weight in kilograms divided by your height squared in meters. So there is an adjustment to this that you can do if you've got pounds and feet inches, but the base unit was defined in terms of kilograms and meters. So technically, it's an SI unit. You're so proud of that joke, but neither of us get it. What it- Yeah, I don't understand. <laughs> so scientific international. So these are like your standard international units of measurement for stuff. Right. right. So. so your meters, kilograms, joules, all that sort of stuff. So what you've done is you've just stated a, a fact in the tone that one would state a joke. <laughs> it, it's also a joke because SI is the, is the statistically insignificant. Last, okay, last time we recorded for the bonus episode, Dean spent a good five minutes lecturing me <laughs> on branding. And now I make a joke that is branding and you don't even fucking get it. <laughs> I, I gotta be honest, I haven't internalized the, the abbreviation. <laughs> so I just... That was a good joke, Tess. That was, was really good. Mm -hmm. Well done. Thank well you. <laughs> so the units here are kg per meters squared, which actually looks a bit like a density measurement. If you are trying to measure a density, you will typically do mass by unit of volume. Well, volume is like meters cubed. Meters squared is an area. So we can kind of think of this as an idea of density that is based on an area measured by your height squared rather than a volume for your body. Right. So... It's assuming a uniform density of a human body, of human bodies. Kind of, yeah. It's, it's kind of flattening, you know, in a sense, because you've lost that extra dimension for volume. Right, okay, I understand. Yeah, so if you were doing a density, this would be mass per unit of volume, or something like kilograms on meters cubed. It's hard to measure the volume of your body because you have to do something like water displacement in order to get that idea of like physical volume because you're you know you're a three-dimensional object you're a three-dimensional body measuring your volume is difficult measuring your height is a one-dimensional measurement that's really easy you can do it with a tape measure the problem there is that by kind of masquerading as a density measurement you lose a lot of information about the actual density of a person's body. Muscle is more dense than fat. Bone can be more dense than fat or muscle. It's typically more dense than fat, I think. By using height only as your metric that tries to get at some sort of density thing, you are disguising the variations in composition of somebody's body tissue. And this is where you get things where bodybuilders or athletes show up on BMI as yeah. uh, obese because they're just very muscle dense. Yeah, so this is not a metric for fitness, even though it is used as a metric for fitness. And any fit fat person has raged against that fact in the past. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, even like fit people who are not fat, but who are dense in muscle have raged against that. When I was at high school, they did something called a skin fold test on me, which was supposed to measure fat more accurately than this, which in retrospect was probably not something you should put on high school's children, now that I think about it and say it out yeah. loud. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> so we're going to get to, shall we say, um, pathologies in fat discrimination and things like that. But yeah, uh, one of the alternate ways of measuring subcutaneous fat, I think it is called, so this is the layer of fat immediately on your skin is a skin fold. So they basically pinch a fold of the skin, usually on your abdomen, and see how much they have to pinch to actually get it to fold in on itself. If you have very little fat, you have to pinch relatively little because you don't have a particularly thick layer of fat under your skin. If you have a lot of fat under your skin, you have to pinch more of it in order to get that fold. So a bigger fold means you have more fat under your skin. It sounds very rigorous and reliable. It's more reliable than BMI. Well, fair enough. <laughs> but that is 
as a metric for fat composition. Okay. BMI isn't measuring fat composition, even though it's used as a proxy for fatness. This right. is one of the, the major difficulties with using it, because nothing in this kilograms... Oh, here it is, kilograms per meter. Nothing in there is actually measuring fat directly. You know, there's a bunch of circumstances which mean that BMI just isn't inaccurate. Me, for example... And my habit of swallowing large golf ball size quantities of lead, um, I find that as those accru accumulate in the body, I am increasingly told I am overweight. Mm, it's true. Well, I've been eating the same weight of, uh, but in feathers, and actually they haven't <laughs> declared me overweight at all. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. From the BMI, we get our classic, I'm going to call them fat categories, categories, even though they're not, because they're not based on actual fatness. We have classic BMI classes. Isn't one of them healthy? One of them is normal. 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 Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew there was an incredible term in there. Yeah. Uh -huh. First one is underweight, which is usually a BMI less than 18.4. We're going off the World Health Organization categories. We'll talk about some variation in them later. There are kind of subclasses of underweight based on how severely underweight your class to be. So I think if you are under like 16 or under 14 or something, you're considered um, like severely underweight and things. This is basically to capture cases of extreme malnutrition and things like that. The next is normal range, which is 18.5 to 24.9. Uh, you get these kind of numerical boundaries because the, of the level of precision that you have at the measurement, right? You can think of it basically as underweight is up to 18.5, normal range is up to 25, is the typical way of doing that. I'm also gonna, for my own satisfaction, Put quotation marks around the <laughs> Okay, so we have overweight, which is also called, I shit you not, pre-obese. What? I'm not even joking. Depending on the literature, right? Oh, fucking Hollywood these days. Always <laughs> with the prequels. Yeah, you can still get pregnant from pre-obesity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is 25 to 29.9. This column is the BMI, right? I'm just going to write it really small in here in case that wasn't obvious. Okay. And then you have obese, which is considered, I think, quite justifiably a slur by some fat activists, which is 30 plus. Now, there are subcategories of obese. You could have, like, class 3, which is the highest class, is, like, above 40. So I might, I, I'm going to make my notation here more consistent. Greater than 30, greater than 40. Yeah. Oh, that'll be greater than or equal to. Why can no medical stuff decide whether classes should go up or down <laughs> in <laughs> well, scale. So these are typically more extreme. Yeah. So like class one obese is just above 30. Class two obese is like 35 to 40. Class three obese is above 40. So it's further from the quote unquote normal range in the same way that underweight is about more extreme. It makes sense in this, like in that you are measuring levels of extremeness, but it's not directly a, a scale related to the actual BMI. But like first degree burns are like a more extreme than third degree burns, right? No, other way around. Oh, okay. So it all yeah. actually does go the same way. Right, right. Oh, that's what I've been doing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Mm. I wanted to ask BMI, right? Yeah. Obviously many problems with it. It's not completely useless as a extremely general measure. Is it useful on a population scale? Like how did it come about? Okay. So it came about because a guy wanted something that was better than weight. And it is better than weight in that it can account for your height. Right, okay. So the problem is that, as with any of these sorts of metrics, one guy thinking, oh, this could be useful in some cases, it should not be taken to be a diagnostic tool, it should be re-studied and to, to determine whether or not it's, it's clinically useful, then becomes it is your standard metric for these things across the whole population, basically because it's easy to measure. Yeah, and it's useful. It's... Well, no, no, no. Sorry. When I say useful, I mean useful for the purposes of... Fatphobic people, yeah. Fatphobic <laughs> people and for, for just slapping a category on there, sorry. Yeah, I mean, if you want a category of fatness, this is one that you can justify, quote unquote, based on physical measurements, height and weight. It's got two measurements, so... It's got it's... two things. That is at least one dimension more complex than weight alone. Just, I mean, hey... <laughs> I'll take salt. So I, if I'm clever, hey, I do have it. So here is a um, chart of various BMIs. So the lines inside the chart here give you the BMI number. You've got your height on the vertical axis, your weight on the horizontal axis, 
the two different height and weight measurements are basically the transformation from metric to imperial. The number underlying is the same, right? You've got the same height and the same weight. It's just a different value assigned to it based on which system of measurement you're in. And it's interesting that there's different classifications based on height versus weight, but all of them are gay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, extremely. You've got your tweaks and your bears. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it's interesting that what is considered by the scale to be in the malnourished range is put in the, like a very like calming sky blue, whereas what is considered obese by the scale is in like alarm bells red. Yeah, well, you've got to pick a direction, right? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it's far better to starve to death than that you live fat. Mm, it's true. It's true. <laughs> so I will also note this is your underweight. This is your normal overweight and then our classes of obese. yeah so these are your obese classes notice also that the class three obese goes off infinitely theoretically anyway i will also note that they only go up to 120 kilos here which is fucking funny <laughs> to be well, perfectly honest they haven't released the next expansion where you'll be able to rank four up into class four obese yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's coming with the patch i'm 120 kilos so, like, I'm at literally the very top end of this scale on the x-axis here. And I know people who are heavier than me. Quite substantially heavier than me. And in fact, we're going to talk about that. But all of that experience gets lumped into class 3 obese for this scale. That's fucking stupid, frankly. These are not equally spaced intervals, right? So your normal range is... So we'll just uh, put an interval width here. And now you're going to watch me do arithmetic in my head. So technically this is 18.4 wide. Uh, this is, let's say, 5.15 plus 0.15 is so 6.4 wide. This is 4.9 wide. Obese above 30 is technically infinitely wide, right? But the obese class 1 is 5 wide, class 2 is 5 wide, and class 3 is infinite. I just find it interesting, you know, as you point out, that everyone above a certain weight tends to very rapidly fall into... Obese. Class 3 obese, yeah. Obese. Now, I know someone became disabled after a, an accident at their job and put on an extreme amount of weight, which I think is, is fair to say. And they would definitely fall into what popular society would think of as somebody who is extremely obese. Yeah. This person uh, has lost weight, but is still like larger than anyone you'd see typically day to day, uh, because most people who get to that weight are often shamed out of society. Yep. Well, we will talk about that, don't worry. Right. Whereas, if you don't mind me talking about your body briefly, yeah, Tess, in terms of the experience of meeting you and that person, yeah. the shapes and composition of your body are so different, both in terms of your ability and just, I don't know, the general aesthetic. Yeah. Like, again, cut this as but you go in at the waist. There are ranges of experience in this mega obese category that are not reflected by that this. Are, that are completely different, right? This, this, yeah, yeah. this person is disabled by their weight in addition to the disability that led them gaining the weight. Yep. Whereas you kick people's ass at a boxing gym. Like We will actually talk about this. So when we talk about the size categories that fat activists have come up with, we exactly get to that sort of differentiation. Because in this kind of class 3 obese category is such an immense range of experience. Right, that, that's what I'm getting at. Like, it's pointless to put you in the same class when your experiences of life yeah, absolutely. as a result of your weight are so shockingly one of, different. One of the biggest problems with these categories is just how little of the actual range of human experience they represent. It's basically that above the above the 30 mark but perhaps more critically above the 40 mark you're gonna die because you're fat is what you get told about your body and it's just not fucking true i know, i mean i i internalized it a lot like when i was at the hospital because i had appendicitis yeah i was talking to the doctor and he said you know we'll have to take you in for surgery about risks and things and he said you're a young healthy man etc and i immediately balked at that because in my mind just from internalizing this i thought no i'm overweight i can't be healthy mm. I then go talk to my doctor and I get results, get stuff back. Like my cholesterol is actually fine. It turns out that from the perspective of most of the things that kill you, uh, having a gut does not mean that you are about to fall over. And it's very weird to be told that after, you know, 30 years of being told that you're on the verge of, of, of death. Of death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are actually going to talk about this. Um, and one of the things that prompted this episode was that the American Medical Association has finally come out and said, oh, maybe BMI is not a great idea, actually. Maybe fat phobia is actually hurting people. 
Shocker, but we will get to that in a second. Before we get to that, I want to talk a bit more in detail about structural problems with this classification system, because this is a classification system for fatness based on BMI specifically. The first problem that I'm, and I've got a list, they are numbered. <laughs> so problem one. Another grievances episode. All of my episodes are grievances episodes. <laughs> Okay, so problem one. Like, this is basically euphemistic. Yeah, the, the phrase weight is doing a lot of heavy lifting in the terms of underweight and overweight there. Yeah, so BMI is fundamentally used for fatness, but doesn't measure it. Not really. Yeah, for all the reasons we just described. Yeah, and that is for a bunch of reasons. The first of which is that it's hard to measure fatness, particularly in kind of a numeric way. The second is that because the assumption is that fat is an insult, we've come up with all of these euphemisms for fatness, overweight, obese, all this sort of stuff, which in their own right are more harmful because they just instantiate that underlying, I guess, insult that is fatness, right? They instantiate the fact that fat is bad by referring to them euphemistically. Right. This is one of the reasons that fat activists reject categories like overweight and underweight and that sort of thing. Fat activists talk explicitly about skinniness and fatness, and fat activists do quite directly acknowledge that thin people have a shit time of it too, but the structural barriers are less for very thin people than they are for very fat people. I think we should just change a scale that only uses like um, the euphemisms for uh, attractive curvaceousness. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got thick... Uh, we've got thick with... No, it's just thick with an increasing amount of thick. <laughs> I'm sure I've told you two both this story before, but I am so isolated from a lot of popular culture <laughs> that when I first saw the term thick being pro popularized to refer to fat women, I thought, because I only saw it in text, I didn't see it in the context of images or whatever, I thought it was just, like, thick in the, in the like insulting someone's intelligence sense. <laughs> so I started to about four weeks. I genuinely thought that all of a sudden there was this huge fetish for stupid women going around. Damn, she's thick. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I saw pictures associated with it, I was like, oh, I get it now. But I, I did not understand for an extended period of time. I think I only finally got it when you referred to me as extra thick. And I was like, excuse me? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to wrangle us back. Part of the euphemism is that using these terms, like overweight, just reinforces the fatness stigma. Right, and I think carries uh, an underlying sort of injunction that you should lose to become weight. Yes. I mean, if anything, it is kind of an imperative. Yeah, yeah, it's, it does. It carries an, an, an intrinsic judgment in the form of the word. It's really just, I know that they, to say normal weight, but overweight implies the existence of a just weight. Yes. It's a term that comes from engineering. Right. Which is just, you're too big for this. Well, fuck you, buddy. Build it better. Problem two. Damn, girl, are you exceeding the maximum allotted load for this surface? <laughs> <laughs> it's racist and it's sexist. Yeah, I was going to say, because there's some peoples in the world whose, whose body shape and density and height radically diverge from what that chart expects. Yeah, yeah. The reason that these were constructed is that theoretically you can use them to look at associations with negative health outcomes, right? Right. The point at which those negative health outcomes occur changes based on things like where you live and your gender. Gender broadly defined. I have a, an apocryphal story from a, a trans woman friend of mine who, when undergoing her initial, like, I guess, administrative transition with her doctor and things, as soon as she signed the paperwork to, like, swap her gender and everything over, her doctor, who had never brought this up before, immediately said, right, now we need to talk about your weight. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, hey, that doctor is an ally. <laughs> that doctor is an ally <laughs> on one side. <laughs> now, apparently he wasn't, like, hugely fat phobic about it. But anyway, the idea being that where on this sort of a scale the actual increases in, in problems lie changes based on broadly, we'll call it race because that's the, the lines along which it is structured socially, and, I mean, class too does come into play, but that is not studied so widely, and gender. Specifically, if you are a black person in the United States, the point at which you start to see stronger negative health outcomes is higher than for the white population. Likewise, if you are in Eastern Asia, 
for example, where those, I'm making air quotes here, overweight and obese thresholds should lie if they are to measure negative health outcomes should be much lower than it is for white people in America and whatever. In fact, a whole bunch of countries have actually adjusted their particular national BMI standards to reflect this fact. Often, like, countries will do that independent of race sort of categories, but they will just do that to reflect new research which can lead to the extremely funny phenomena of people literally becoming fat overnight. Usually, it takes a couple of months at least, right? I thought you were going to say something, I have a comment, but I'll wait for you. That is part of, like, undercurrent assumption that fatness necessarily equates to poor eating, right? Which doesn't necessarily, yes. like... Yeah, there's famously, throughout history, you can get extremely fat by eating extremely well by the standards of the society of the at the time. I wonder, like, fucking the royals all have fucking gout from eating, like, duck organs back to back. But whereas your average Briton who might be, quote unquote, overweight, is not experiencing, like, a force-fed duck liver. <laughs> like, your, your diet in the context of your, not only informing your weight, but in your body's response to the food that you eat at that weight is so different. Yeah, well, this is one of parts of problem three. BMI slash categories is a bad proxy for health. Yeah, without losing a kilogram. I mean, I did lose weight as a result of the change, but immediately, changes in my diet to vegetarianism and to other things improved my health in ways that I won't burden the listener with hearing, in ways that are immeasurably good for my outlook, my my general demeanor and happiness day to day, but my weight didn't shift, you know, an inch relative to the... the well, a kilogram. My... It's just the other metric. <laughs> get what I mean. Yeah. Well, I, this is... I'm going to use the term the obesity paradox here, and we'll get to what that means in a second. But because fatness, measured by BMI in particular, fatness on the whole is better correlated with negative health outcomes than BMI. Because BMI is such a bad measurement of fatness, and I want to make very clear here that there is a distinction between the existence of negative health outcomes and the moral responsibility for them. The moral responsibility for them is where you get into fat discrimination stuff. The existence just means somebody needs care, and that is not a moral responsibility. Yeah, I mean, obviously we're going to get at some point in the episode into talking about the lack of agency in determining how fat you are if you live in an area where you literally don't have access to food that would um, maintain your body at a lower weight. Yeah. For some reason, eating disorders have been a large part of my romantic relationships over the years, and the healthcare outcomes from those seem equally violent and horrible as that of, uh... Being fat. Being fat, yeah. Oh, don't worry, we will get to eating disorders, because you cannot have a conversation about this without it. The kind of broad idea here is that extremely fat people, and very thin people, have overall worse health outcomes. That is not a controversial point. How those line up with BMI and categories is complicated for all of the reasons like we've just discussed, right? This is a bad metric to represent fatness. What happens in the middle is more complicated. It certainly is not as straightforward as the more fat equals worse, or in particular, the higher in these ordered categories means worse, that is typically sold to people. Not least because how much is actually wrapped up in that kind of class 3 obese and above, right? Basically everybody above, let's say, 100 kilos is probably going to wind up being class 3 obese unless they're, like, very, very tall, right? Yeah. That's an awful lot of your population. And as mentioned, that is a hugely varying physiological experience and that is just not contained in basically any of the research that I have seen that relies on BMI categories, because it can't measure that. Fuck, it's so fucked. If you are going to try and measure this stuff, at the very least you need a much greater gradation of very fat people. Sorry, very obese, let's use the terminology in the chart. At the very least you need a much greater gradation to detect anything. But it doesn't happen, so you get fucked results that become the quote-unquote obesity paradox. What that actually means is that fat people do not have the negative health outcomes that fat phobia predicts. That's the obesity paradox. It's only a paradox if you think that fatness is always going to lead to worse outcomes, starting from the normal weight BMI category. So I have a figure here 
that is representative of this sort of process. So this comes from a systematic review and meta-analysis of mortality and coronary outcomes based on BMI. This is a 2015 paper, I think it was something like over a million people in total, and this was basically looking at short and long-term follow-up. So here you have less than six months follow-up, long-term is greater than or equal to six months, or greater than five years follow-up. So these are basically people who have been diagnosed with coronary artery disease, and then looking at their mortality and coronary events long term. So is higher a greater occurrence of these? So this is relative risk. And I'm assuming the relative risk is higher. If you have a big number, you have more risk comparison to the base group. So the base group in all of these, the one on the line one, is normal weight. Relative risk is looking at your increased risk of mortality, so all-cause mortality, so that means death by any reason, right. compared to people in the normal weight category. So, so what I'm seeing here is being underweight is way worse for your heart than... This is all-cause mortality. Oh, all-cause mortality. Yeah, yeah, so one of the difficulties with this sort of research is that all-cause mortality doesn't just look at coronary mortality, right? These are people who don't just die from heart problems, even though this is in a paper about coronary di artery disease. Just imagining a whole bunch of skinny people falling into wood chippers. Getting hit by cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, quite literally that will be included. So this is one of my eternal hatred in statistics around death for fat people, is that most of the statistics you see in popular culture around mortality for fat people is based on the assumption that if a fat person dies, it's because they were fat, regardless of the actual reason. And you can see this in a lot of estimates around how much obesity is costing the economy, which is basically a measurement of healthcare and lost work and things related to fatness, where every problem or every death that a fat person experiences is because they are fat. Mm, our old friend capitalism. <laughs> you had told me about this previously, I had a little bit of a spoiler. I didn't realize how dramatic it was for underweight people facing sort of increased mortality. <laughs> that adjusted estimates... Skinny people, no resilience. They can't handle it. <laughs> <laughs> I should have looked, but I didn't. I don't know what adjustments were made to these estimates. I'm not going to speak to it because I don't know off the top of my head. But certainly you can see in the short term in particular, underweight people had much worse outcome. Yeah, and I'm not a doctor enough to point to this, but I think it, it is very illustrative. So the obesity paradox is not here. The obesity paradox is here. Sorry, that's what I'm getting at. This is the, the graph overall points out that there's A, not a relative to the risks of being underweight, not an immense increase in risk, but also that it levels off. Well, more importantly, in here, this is a reduced risk because it's below the line of one. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If you are below that line of one, you have a reduced risk in comparison to normal weight. Fat people stay winning. Fat people stay winning. <laughs> here you've got this sort of a shape, right? So this is what we call a confidence interval. We have not talked about them before on the podcast. What you can think of this is that interval is representing a band of what we think are reasonable estimates for the true value. So reasonable estimates estimates for the overall relative risk based on what we have seen. If that bar does not include one, then we would say that we have an observable difference between the groups. Right. For overweight people, for example, the bars here are below that one line. So we can say we have observed a reduced risk for overweight people compared to normal weight. Here, for underweight people, the bars are above one. So we can say we have observed an increased risk as compared to normal people. If you have a bar that overlaps with that dotted line of one, you have not observed a difference. For statistical reasons, you have not seen enough difference to make you think that there's actually something going on. So we can see here that for overweight and obesity grade one, you either see a reduced risk or equivalent risk. If you are obesity grade two or three, it's kind of on the whole not different from normal weight. If you have greater than five year follow-up, you see an overall increased risk. That's what this says. And this is called a J-shaped curve. That's not a J. A J <laughs> L-shaped curve. curve. Well, this is one of the reasons that I drew it backwards, right? Because it's going the other fucking way. <laughs> anyway, I do not like this chart because, as we discussed, these categories are not equally spaced. 
even within the metric of BMI, which is what they are based on. Having these sorts of lines connecting these here misrepresents the distance, and I'm making air quotes here because you can't really measure the difference, between these categories. In this obesity grade two and three, if we come back to here, that's everything from this line on. Right. That's a fucking problem because that's potentially an awful lot of your weight scale, and it is in fact an awful lot of your weight scale and your fatness scale, that's all lumped into the one category. So you have lost meaningful distinctions because you do not have enough of a meaningful scale to actually do that measurement. Right, so where it flicks up at the end there, in reality, if you had more meaningful distinctions, it may continue. Yeah, I mean, you could see it go up, 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 right? You could or maintain a flatness. Yeah, or maintain a flatness. We don't know because that information is not made available to us. Yeah. It could just as equally as Dean said, like, flatten out. It might be slightly higher, but it might not be as high as for underweight people. I mean, I expect, as we discussed, it's not controversial to say there's a correlation between extreme levels of fatness and poor health outcomes. No, but this does not necessarily mean that those poor health outcomes are a direct response to being fat right, in a but, physiological sense. Right, and but also I'm just saying that it probably would continue along for a lot greater period before it started to uptick again, assuming Well, that. you cannot make those comparisons because the distance here does not make sense. Well, I'll make it a guess. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you could certainly imagine that if you had equally spaced BMI categories here, it would kind of go like that, right? Yeah, yeah. The problem I'm being... A hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> if you actually look at measurements of BMI compared to things like relative risk, so these are not measurements of BMI, these are classes of BMI, and you've got everybody in the population is lumped into a single point here, right? Yeah. Yeah. You do get a sort of increase here if you have actual, like, each person is a dot for their BMI and, like, some metric. You can't do that with relative risk because relative risk is about population level stuff, so you have to do this. But you can do better classes than this, even based on BMI. And I'm imagining, I'm just picturing, maybe the because the overweight people aren't um, engaged in, like, a lacrosse, they aren't dying of lacrosse balls to the, well, yeah, this to the is face, etc. This is such a huge part of this, right? You cannot look at all-cause mortality and make any reasonable prescription based on fatness. Right, yeah, exactly. Getting hit by a car may, in a very strict sense, be more likely if you are fat. <laughs> right? right? That's just a hitbox question. That's just a hitbox question, exactly. <laughs> Fucking gamers. Arguably, it could go the other way, right? You're less likely to be seen if you're extremely skinny, so... That's true. Mm. But on the whole, all-cause mortality is a really shit thing to try and compare to any sort of health metric. You need to get an awful lot more specific than that. There are other studies that have looked specifically at cardiovascular mortality, but they see similar sort of behavior. People who are overweight and, shall we say, on the smaller end of the obesity scale actually have equivalent or better outcomes than people who are classed as normal weight. This is, of course, not the only form of health, but gee, it sure counteracts the fact that you get told a lot if you're a fat person, oh my god, you're so fat, you're gonna die. Yeah, and certainly, like we discussed, because it's all cause, you can't draw a lot of meaningful conclusions, but all cause mortality is sort of, it's often what's presented to you as a fat person as yeah. your, it's like you, oh my something's going to kill you, you're more at risk for everything. Yeah, and so much of that does not address the underlying cause of what might be the reason that fat people have increased mortality in some circumstances. One of those things is medical discrimination. Yeah. Like, this is, I think, more of a problem in the US than it is here because of their fucked medical system, but it certainly does happen here. But fat people are denied care, systemically. Fat people have later diagnoses of cancer. Fat people have later diagnoses of just about everything except possibly diabetes. And it's mostly because they get told oh, go lose some weight in response to basically every health problem. So this is actually in Australia, but I know a guy who had a hernia. So this is a perforation of the abdominal wall, sorry Dean, you've got to get uncomfortable with this, that allows your guts to basically extrude out from where they should be. Mm. It sucks. It's yeah. extremely painful. You will frequently feel pain that makes you think you're dying because you can actually die if it happens too badly. And Anyway. He's a fat guy. He got told by the surgeon that he would have to lose a lot of weight in order to qualify for the surgery. This is not because he was at increased risk. 
during the surgery. This is not because he would necessarily have more complications immediately after. The reason is that he had an increased risk of the hernia reoccurring after five years. <laughs> so this person was denied hernia surgery until they starved themselves down to a weight that this doctor thought was acceptable to do the surgery. I don't know if he's had it yet. I haven't seen him in a while. This took about two and a half years. So in that two and a half years, he wound up in hospital a handful of times because the hernia pain was so bad he thought he was going to die. He was in constant pain because he had a fucking hernia. He was starving because he'd been told by this doctor to lose all this weight. And he was just fucking miserable for that entire time, which has a deleterious effect on your well-being, all because he had an increased risk of recurrence within five years. Yeah, I wonder what his increased risk of bad health outcomes were in five years from not having the surgery. This was apparently not a factor. He, he's never going to listen to this, but he did not accept my objection to this as fatphobic, basically because he thought, well, I needed to lose the weight anyway, and <laughs> fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that is absolutely medical discrimination. There are some comparisons between medicine and tech support. <laughs> because you've got an unknown problem. Yeah. You've got to work through from start to finish sort of your checklist of what about if I do this, does this hurt? If I do this, does this hurt? To work out what the problem is. And if you're a shitty tech support person, you can write off a lot of genuine technical concerns as uh, clear your cation cookies. <laughs> or a your internet connection must not be very good, etc. Like, there's so many cop-out ways to not investigate deeper into the cause of something that might be unrelated to anything systemic or unrelated to something that's obvious. And I get the sense that that's a lot of what you run into with doctors dismissing fat people's pain and conditions because it's just so easy to say, well, your health outcomes are going to be better if you improve this, so yeah, and first things first, let's fix that. Yeah, and particularly in the US where healthcare is already so fucked. It's an easy out, and a lot of doctors have internalized the fat phobia as well. Yeah, yeah, but I'm also just saying that you should not trust that doctors are capable. No, <laughs> no. Broadly speaking, medicine works. Specifically speaking, doctors may not. And anybody who has a chronic illness will tell you that there are a lot of shit doctors out there. Well, the other thing is the way that the American system is set up is that it's incredibly expensive to become a doctor. And they use that as a system of hierarchy, which means yes. that there are less doctors in Mississippi than there are in Kazakhstan, kind of like. Yeah, the yeah, access to medicine is difficult, yeah. particularly when you are poor. And not even literally being able to afford it. They may just not be a doctor. I mean, you yeah. see similar stuff here in rural communities, actually. Absolutely. But that yeah, is yeah. a very different discussion. I, I have just written to... down problem 3.1, correlation is not causation, which I think covers a lot of what we've just been talking about. This should just be a permanent slide in, our, <laughs> in the podcast. Oh, well, I mean, it's not always correct, but I'm going to throw it right here. People can die from things other than being fat. <laughs> yeah. Surprise, surprise. People have massive problems with nutritional health in an environment where a lack of access to nutrients means they eat a lot of food that makes them fat. Yes, and there can, I'm just going to write here that underlying causes can contribute to fatness and health problems. Right, yeah. yeah the thing that makes you fat can also be the thing that's fucking killing you, unrelated yeah. to the fact that it's making you fat. Yeah. Well, also, I'm six foot three. I pass a BMI fine. But yeah. I eat like shit. Like Yes. So what I what I will say about like eating like shit, right, is that for one, you have to look at this as population level stuff, not individual. But also you, you smoke, bud. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that researchers in this will tell you is that you need a really large sample size of non smokers to control for the fact that smoking causes bad health and smoking tends to correlate with being thinner. A lot of the literature that looks at the impact of obesity. Does it now? Hmm. <laughs> no, we are anti fat phobia. No, <laughs> I want to make weight to do an amateur boxing fight. My interest yeah, you is... think fucking smoking is going to help me? With that? <laughs> well, it means I'd be I'd make the weight, you know. Yeah, you'd gas out after two minutes. Anyway. <laughs> that will fight somebody who's fit at my weight. And let me tell you, <laughs> we'll see what's worse for my overall health outcomes. <laughs> what you see in research is that. You will have a, a group who are people who have never smoked, and that leads to a clearer relationship between weight or BMI and negative health outcomes. But that's not what fucking gets applied to us. In practice, you cannot have 
medical people saying, oh, you've never smoked, but you're fat, so that means you're at risk. That's not what we actually experience. We experience fat phobia. And while there is certainly social barriers to participation if you are a smoker, I do I do observe that, that is radically different to what you experience if you're a fat person. Oh, absolutely. I make a note just that that's why I found so jarring about my experience at the hospital was that the experience was different there. Yeah. The description of me as healthy from multiple doctors in the process saying that your levels are all good, you don't smoke, you don't drink. Their discussions with me about my health outcomes were limited to those sort of items. And because my weight is not at a point where it's at the other end of that J curve, mm. it was so jarring to me because even doctors who I quite like still speak in terms of weight as this underlying negative pressure on, on every single life outcome. And then to go to the hospital where I guess they're far more... They deal with acute problems, let's say. Right. And so they, they're not maybe as systematically haven't internalized the same fat phobic measurements. It's interesting to... Well, so there is a genuine push led by fat activists, mostly, to change the way that medical discrimination happens. And it's working. It turns out that you can change a doctor doctor's willingness to treat fat people and to treat them for their actual underlying health problems with, like, one lecture at university talking about this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Doctors on the whole are not inherently bigoted people. On the whole, there are certainly bigoted doctors, but you can teach them that there are other things going on. And I think on the whole, they generally do understand that. It's just that all of this structural pressure is to look for easy answers that are bad. And all of the medical research is pressured to look for easy things to measure, which BMI is. As I mentioned before, the AMA has recently come out and said, actually, BMI is bad. Or well, bad as a statistic, bad as an instrument to use to classify people and things like that. And in the report that they did this, they talk about a myriad of other things like family history of disease, genetic factors, smoking and alcohol consumption, medication-induced obesity, occupation. I mean, they don't necessarily explicitly talk about class, but let's say class as well, pollution exposure, all of these sorts of things that lead to negative health outcomes in a much more direct way than BMI being high. And particularly BMI being high according to this fucking classification system. Yeah, it's amazing that we have an epidemic of mental health issues caused by the fact that our society is fucking disintegrating and evil. So everyone gets put on... Antidepressants? Antidepressants, which can often lead to gaining of weight. And then you go to your doctor and they fucking tell you off for being fat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wanted to read a passage from that report because I think it's very relevant here to the idea that correlation is not causation and also the broader health problems that fat discrimination does, which is about eating disorders. This is section... H150.965. I love this bit. The AMA 1 adopts the position that overemphasis of bodily thinness is as deleterious to one's physical and mental health as obesity, which is an interesting statement because that presupposes that physical and mental health is negatively affected by obesity. But anyway, asks its members to help their patients avoid obsession with dieting and to develop balanced, individualized approaches to finding the body weight that is best for each of them. Three, encourages training of all school-based physicians, counselors, coaches, trainers, teachers, and nurses to recognize unhealthy eating, binge eating, dieting, and weight-restrictive behaviors in adolescents, and to offer education and appropriate referral of adolescents and their families for culturally informed intervention counselling. And four, participates in this effort by consulting with appropriate and culturally informed educational and counselling materials pertaining to unhealthy eating, binge eating, dieting, and weight restrictive behaviour. So what this is finally saying is that fat people can have eating disorders too. Oh, absolutely. In fact, fat people are underdiagnosed for eating disorders because... I mean, in places you literally cannot be classified as having anorexia or access care for eating disorders if you don't have a BMI under, like, 18 or something. Oof. It's insane. I'm oh, sorry, we can't treat you for anorexia. You're not doing it enough. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I'm not joking when I say that Weight Watchers and a whole bunch of diets are basically training you to have an eating disorder. I used to have a... Well, still do have a friend, but he lives in America, so I don't see him very often, but who is a health journalist, or was. Mm. I think he does marketing now, but... Um, Look, it happens to the best of us. <laughs> when he was a health journalist, was always exalting, you know, like, day-long fasting and that kind of thing. Oh, yeah? I said to him, 
no, I can't, like, go an entire day without eating. Like, that would feel horrible. And he's like, oh, don't you ever, like, just have a day where, like, you don't want to eat or whatever. Talking it to people who have gone through the process of covering from eating disorders and stuff, I'm pretty sure he had an eating disorder and was using it in the pages of, like, health press kind of thing. Like <laughs> Jesus Christ. Thin people, or shall we say normal-sized people, shall we say normal BMI weight people, will often internalize their fat phobia in a manner that makes them manage their weight in a disordered fashion. Because they are so terrified of becoming fat that they will abuse themselves even if they don't necessarily drop into the underweight category. E everybody who has complained, oh my god, I'm so fat, I have to lose like 10 pounds or something. I mean, that's the American version, right? But you can imagine a couple of kilos or whatever, right? If I lose a couple of kilos, I'm 118 kilos. <laughs> yeah. It's like the amount of weight, the amount of fat that I would be expected to lose in order to classify as normal weight is another fucking person worth. A friend of mine, my best friend in general, know them since I was a kid. We had always been fat together. And we often comment that when you are of a quote unquote normal weight, the idea of weight management is usually an adjustment of a few kilos. And frankly, up here in the in the high scale, up here at the advanced classes. <laughs> yeah, that's us. We, we pointed out that between the two of us, in our various fat phobic induced drives to shrink ourselves through pain and suffering, have lost more weight than these skinny people in their own weight management and even can see endeavors them, yeah. have done in their entire lives. And we would do that regularly. I, I do not do that anymore, thankfully. Um, you can, I just got to leave out this hopeful note to any people struggling with internalized fat phobia. It is possible to not feel like that. Yeah, it is. That's really important for people to hear. And anybody with an eating disorder, there is a life after eating disorders. It is recoverable. And I just want to make sure that's really clear so people don't think like they have to feel like this forever. Just to finish that, like when I was on sort of the last big kick where I, before I just decided, you know, maybe I should just be happy instead of murdering myself, lost close to 20 kilos in, what, what was it, six, seven months? Like... Really accelerate. I wasn't trying to lose it that fast. I was just eating an extremely strict diet, working out a bunch, and I was still fat. Yes. I lost 20 kilos. I, I could was... lose 30 kilos and still be fat. I mean, like... <laughs> right. Whereas, you know, some of the people whom uh, I go to the gym with who are often trying to give me sort of weight management advice, if they lost that kind of weight, they'd be dead. Yes. <laughs> so it's like, like, I can lose. 62 kilo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can <laughs> lose weight. It's not, it's just evidently there's something going on with my body that's greater than just, you know, a matter of consumer choices. <laughs> Literally. Well, one thing that does come up in the research around people who have lost a lot of weight and fat people that is not often talked about in relation to health outcomes, is that losing a lot of weight radically changes your metabolic system, and it radically changes your body, particularly if you do it repeatedly. So people who lose a lot of weight, regain it, lose a lot of weight, regain it, because they do, like, yo-yo dieting and punishing exercise regimes so they, like, they can't keep up and this sort of thing, often wind up doing more long-term damage than they would have otherwise at the higher weight being relatively stable. This is actually comes up in the AMA statement. They um, talk about stability of weight is often really important for long-term health, but is never fucking measured in any of the actual research that looks at long-term health outcomes. Yeah, I used to have a stable weight at around 110. Yeah. And I was there for, I don't know, eight, nine years. Mm -hmm. Then I went on a kick because... And, and I think don't think my... Like I said, I wanted to lose weight to for boxing. Yeah. And I don't think that's a terrible reason to do it. So I went on a I series am never, of Okay, want to be clear. I am never judging an individual person for their bodies. These are systemic problems. Right, right. And I went on these dieting and, and workout things where I um, lost a bunch of weight several times and then something would happen. I'd get an injury or something. And then the moment I stopped being hyper vigilant, I put all the weight back on. As and a result, more, typically. Yeah, and as a result of all my efforts, and I have a stable weight of 120. Yeah. <laughs> the outcome of all my efforts is that I got fatter. And that's not just an individual. Yeah. Yeah, it's super common amongst people trying to lose weight that what you all you end up doing is just increasing your overall stable weight so one of the things that contributes this to this is that your metabolism slows down when you're starving and because calorie restriction is such a huge part of most of the ways that people lose weight your body thinks it's starving and so your your metabolism becomes more efficient which means you le need less food to do the same stuff 
and in the most extreme cases, and you see this with people who were contestants on The Biggest Loser and things like that, which I have a vendetta against that show. I fucking hate it. What, what you see is that the people who went on there lost a whole bunch of weight. About 5% of them maintained their lower weight. This is consistent across the population as a whole. About 5% of people actually manage, in terms of like 5, 10 year long sort of follow-up, to maintain a lower weight when they go on diet programs. Yeah, because it turns out your fucking lifestyle and circumstance, well, more than if that, those don't change... Well, no, no, more than that. Once you have lost a whole bunch of weight through calorie restriction and your metabolic rate decreases, you literally need less food in order to survive to some extent, but also your body's response to any more calorie or any more food being available is to immediately store that because you're starving. Yeah. So you wind up gaining often more weight back, even if you don't necessarily return to your previous levels of eating, precisely because your body is just going, fuck, we can't starve, we can't die from this, put as much weight on as possible, it'll happen again. The more you yo-yo diet, the more you have extreme weight loss, particularly through dieting restrictions, the bigger an impact that can be. The more you literally go bear mode, in yes. the sense that you start fattening for huge periods of deprivation. People wind up disabled by this in the sense that they get to a point where they are not able to maintain a act- level of activity that is required for just everyday life because they just don't have the energy to fucking do it. Yeah, yeah. Even if they are gaining weight because their body thinks they have excess food around. Well, that's what happened to me. I ended up, like, I'm eating this restricted diet and then I can't keep up the exercise yeah. that I'm doing to accompany that because I'm just not eating. Yeah. Fucking any, anyone who's considering typing in the comments that Dean just did it wrong, bro, you, you really have to <laughs> focus on this particular... Miss me with that shit. <laughs> yeah. Tattoo it on your fucking dick instead. I do not need to be reading that. Yes, and, and like as I said, 95% of people who go even through diet plus exercise to lose a large amount of weight, let's say more than 10% of your body weight, they gain it back. 95% of people. Literally the only consistent ways that we have found to get people to lower their weight long-term or surgical. And if you have to do that for your own sanity, you go for it. You do what you gotta. Yep, but a friend do- of mine who I mentioned, who we'd always been fat buddies together, she wanted to be slender again for, for personal reasons that I don't think were fatphobic. No, it's just that she had lived all of her life thinking about her body and being crippled by anxiety about her body, and the only th- way out of that that she saw was the gastric sleeve. Yeah, I, mean, I don't want to speak wrong. for her, and but I... This is not about fat phobia. This is about she experienced a lifetime of relentless fat shaming, and that was the only out that she saw. I mean, she she also had intentions for her life that required her to be at a lower weight, like like sporting and, and other endeavours. But, yeah, you know, it's... And I, I wonder, I don't want to speak for her, how much of that is that you end up with what amounts to a kind of dysmorphia. I don't know if that's yes. a, yeah, appropriate yeah. to say. You know, you end up with the, what's the phrase, you know, inside of every fat person is a thin person waiting to get out. Like, <laughs> hey, that's just a creepy image. Yeah. And I just want to say to anybody who thinks, oh, surgery is the easy way out, fuck off. Yeah, absolutely. It is not. It, it is, is not a, easy. It is not at all easy. It's a major surgery. It radically changes your life. The long-term impacts of these kind of gastric surgeries are not well studied either and they can be quite deleterious and also just in terms of what you have to do afterwards it's not a matter of like going to the hospital and then your body just loses the weight you you are getting an assistance for what is still a fairly brutal diet and management program yeah it's just that instead of eating now and you feel full after so much you are constantly hungry because you literally physically cannot eat enough to feel satiated because your stomach is too small and if you do, you will, it will, you will either throw up or it will burst. And you have to fight all the social pressure about eat all the food on your plate, eat the food that is offered. You constantly have to refuse food, turn down food. You have to become everything that um, vegetarians complain about, people pressuring you to eat particular food is a thousand times worse just on quantity. Mm. And in that case, it becomes like a reinforcing thing because like likely in the society that you live in, you have a level of body dysmorphia in that situation. Yeah. And then you kind of like have to like act in slightly bulimic ways. And so that kind of ends up reinforcing back into like further eating disorder stuff. It is really fucking grim. We, we are not a society that lets people be well very comfortably. Yeah. No, no. This, this friend of mine is one of several people I know who got the surgery and she is the only one who did not either have a horrific outcome in terms of something going wrong with the surgery or 
ended up putting the weight back on despite the surgery. Like it's it's not a magic pill. It's just a way of trying to adjust the odds of that 95% grinder. Yeah. And with that grimness, I am going to wrangle us back to talk about the last bit, which is categories by fat people for fat people. These have kind of arisen out of fat activism and fat communities and things and people talking about what is actually a better way of representing our experience. As such, they are not a quantitative system. They are ordered in the same way that the categories based on BMI are ordinal. So these are ordered categories of body size and fatness, basically. They are not objective in the, the way that the medical establishment would dearly love to have. They are not numerical. But they are a reflection of personal experiences and commonalities of experiences that I think are useful and empowering for people to use. Because these have arisen basically from a community process, they are a bit in flux. These definitions are not rigid, and the ones I'm going to present to you are not the final word on fat categories, nor are they rigidly defined. But they are useful, and if you find them useful, by all means, go read up on them and, have, and use them to describe your own experience and things. So first of all, we have categories for non-fat people. The first one is what's called straight-sized. <laughs> Yes. These are your basic non-fat person. They probably fall under the normal BMI category. Fat activists on the whole acknowledge that there are skinny people and there are thin people who experience discrimination based on their weight, but this is about categories of fat experience, so those people are not really included in this. Straight-sized people may experience side effects of fat phobia in the sense that they will experience pressure to not get fatter. They may, in fact, self-monitor their weight or have eating disorders and things in relation to being scared of getting fatter, but they do not experience direct structural discrimination as a result of their size. Within this, as kind of a subcategory, is mid-size. So this has been coined by people who are straight-sized, but on the upper end of straight-sized, right? So they are not thin, but they are not necessarily experiencing pressure to lose weight so much as they are experiencing pressure to not gain it. Right. This is a form of fat phobia. It's just different to the fat phobia that is experienced by fat people. This term was come up with by straight-sized people to describe their own experience. Understand it in that sort of context. I do think that there is a genuine aspect of the experience of being straight-sized, which is you are forever told, oh, don't get fatter. Don't be like those fat people over there. And that's bad. And I think that's particularly gendered as well. Yes. Can I just ask, the use of the term straight, Obviously, I'm thinking about straight, the straight as opposed yeah. to queerness. Is there any... It's a riff on that. Okay. There's probably other contexts that I don't really know, but that's the most obvious one. Right. Where, whereas in the LGBTQ, etc. context, straight is used as sort of, as a way of saying, like, the hegemonic... Yeah, well, straight-sized is being used in that context here. The, right? hegemonic, the hegemonic body size. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Now we get to the facts. First is the small fat, and again, the term fat is very explicitly and deliberately used here because that's what this is about, fundamentally, despite the euphemisms you use in medicine. Small fats are basically on the boundary of being straight-sized. They don't find clothing difficult to find, and I'm going to talk a lot about clothing because that is one of the kind of primary ways because it's directly related to your body size, that fatness interacts with the material world. Literally, in this case, right? Small fat people can find clothing most places. They'll probably be on the upper end of what's available in your standard stores, but it'll be there. Physical spaces can accommodate the bodies of small fat people, which we will immediately see what cases where that doesn't happen in just a second. And you may get some medical discrimination. For example, denial of care is less likely if you're a small fat, but you're probably going to get lectured about your weight and you may be told that you need to reduce it constantly. Next, we have mid-fat. So I am a mid-fat, I would say. Like mid-fat people, typically, I am mostly restricted to looking at plus-size clothing stores. Occasionally, I can get stuff in your bigger, like, department stores and that sort of thing, but it's at the very top end of the sort of scale that they sell, and I may not stock it. Physical spaces kind of become difficult at this sort of size. Anti-homeless armrests on public seating, for example, can impact a fat person. They may be too close together to let a fat person comfortably sit in a seat. Airline seat width becomes a problem. I have an eternal struggle because I am not wealthy enough to afford business class because I have never found an economy seat that does not either have the armrests, like lean down on my hips, 
or otherwise constrain my body in some way. Restaurant chairs also, I pick fights with them on the regular, because if restaurant chairs have arms, they will often have like the supports of those arms come up around my thighs and cut into my thighs. Also, uh, some turnstiles can be a struggle to get through, depending on how fat you are, clearly. But mid-fat is kind of the point where those sorts of structural problems become prevalent. There are also healthcare barriers. So refusal of care pending weight loss tends to start to happen at this size, and you start to see fatness being blamed for other problems. You also kind of get clocked as capital F fat at this size. So I, I use the term clocked quite deliberately, uh, not least of which is because it's very difficult to pretend to be thinner than you are. But <laughs> also because if you get identified as capital F fat, you get treated differently. Yeah, yeah. Would that not be true at small fat as well? It is less likely to happen. Okay, right. These are not hard and fast categories. This is very much representing a gradation in experience. Yeah. But mid fat is where you know, somebody looks at you and goes and identifies you as a fat person, basically. Yeah. Next you have large fat. Unsurprisingly, all of these things get worse. So physical barriers become quite prohibitive to public life. You may or may not be able to sit on typical seating that's available in restaurants or cafes or libraries or whatever else. Physical barriers like doorways and turnstiles and things may literally not fit you. The shops near me have just implemented this stupid fucking like barrier at the end of the self-serve checkouts and somebody is going to get stuck in that and it's going to be an awful time for them. You will be at the top end of most plus size clothing ranges, so like plus size clothing shops still have an upper limit, and large fat people tend to be at that sort of upper limit there. Doctors will almost always suck if you're a large fat person. There are some doctors who don't, and shout out to them, but on the whole you are going to face pretty significant barriers to accessing any kind of care as a result of your body size, which can include things like oh, our machine for an MRI doesn't fit you. Our x-ray machine table isn't calibrated for your weight. These sorts of things literally happen to people, and it, can, it makes their health outcomes worse because they just don't get access to care. Furthermore, at this scale, airlines have become your mortal foe. Yeah. yeah, just give up on flying. Well, not necessarily, but this is where you start to see people being asked to move. This is much more so in the next category that we're going to talk about, but being required to have an extra seat in order to fly anywhere. And this becomes more and more the case as airlines tighten their seats and make them smaller and worse for everybody. Yeah, the idea of, like, you know, not to go too far into your um, posterior dimensions, but, <laughs> you know, the, the problem of airline seating not being adequate is, is not limited to people of the of, of the fat variety. Mm. I'm not sure I'm comfortable being on this podcast with a couple. <laughs> <laughs> I said, look, I said I wasn't going to get too far into it. That's the only comment I'll be making. <laughs> Next, we have what's known as a super fat. Or infinity fat. <laughs> infinity fat? As in infinity. Ah, right, yes. These are the biggest fat people. This is a, a category that, like the BMI, goes as big as it needs to go. This is the point at which fatness becomes quite disabling in a kind of social model of disability sense. This is not to say that being super fat or infinity, infinity fat is necessarily a physiological impairment to you existing, it's more that the human spaces in which we live are not built to accommodate you. So this is a social disability construct in the sense that public life and public spaces are not built for you if you are super fat slash infinity fat. Yeah, so like, when I think about earlier on, I was talking about that person I know who would fit into this. I would say he would be in this class, yeah. Yeah, and he is at that fatness because of an accident yeah so th that happened there so is there any intention that this scale represents or includes commentary on like underlying cause underlying cause absolutely not because for your experience with a fat person it never matters right however fat you are whatever the actual reason if you are a fat person you will inevitably be blamed for your fatness right and it will be seen as a moral failing it doesn't matter if you are fat because you actually just eat compulsively, I mean, for one thing, that's that itself uh, is, is not a... your fault. Yeah, I mean, if yeah. you if you are a compulsive eater, that's a classifiable disorder. You know, like that's that's a pathology. It's not you know a moral failing. Right. As compared to somebody who has been disabled due to an accident, you get treated the same regardless because nobody outside of people who are actually looking to help you give a fuck. Right. And okay. if they are looking to help you, they are in interested in kind of diagnosing something in order to provide care. They are not looking 
to actually ascribe moral fault. Gotcha. Okay, so we're talking about experiences here rather than worrying about sort of yeah. what, what on this scale, any implications or... Yeah, because fatness is about your body size and fatness is not fundamentally about why your body is that size, these are a much better representation of human experience. Aubrey Gordon of the much better podcast Maintenance Phase, which you should absolutely go and listen to at some point, dear listener, and you too as well. She is super fat uh, and she talks a lot about her experience as somebody of that size. She has many stories about the very real violence inflicted on her in public space at this size. So by violence, I mean things like being crushed into an economy class seat and coming out with like bruises and torn skin on her sides because of the way that the armrests cut into her sides. Yeah. People yelling abuse at her in public, people imposing on her space in public, shoving her, otherwise interacting with her in ways that are violent and intended to reinforce the fact that you are fat, it is your fault you are obligated to do something about it. This is common experience, and I will say universal experience at this size from everybody I have heard from who is in super fat or infinity fat. Everybody at this size winds up experiencing some amount of direct discrimination and violence. Because we live in a we live in a society, right, which is <laughs> fundamentally structured to not accommodate these people. The well-meaningness of people trying to, like, help you around that sort of a state does not actually change the fundamental infrastructure of it, which does you harm. And I mean that in a very literal public seats hurt sort of way. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm speaking as a, as devil's advocate here, which I don't, you know, hold up as some moral duty to speak to, but, and I, I'm going to respond to the devil's advocate as well, which is that some people would say, you know, that there has to be an upper limit as to what things are designed to accommodate. You know, we can't uh, account for every range of possible human body expression as, as a society. But the response there, I think, is that society would then have to do something about helping you that didn't include, like, just screaming at you yeah, and uh, shaming you in the hope that that would <laughs> produce some miraculous well, also, biological like, transformation. Where that level sits now is roughly here. Right, exactly. Like, and, and that's roughly because, I mean, even small fat people can experience this sort of stuff. Right. And I guarantee you that... A park bench that is, like, let's say two meters across is, I think, the typical size, right? That does not have stupid fucking knobs or arms on it to prevent people sleeping on it. An infinity fat person can sit on that. Right. A, a restaurant chair, which does not have arms that come up from the sides, which is, like, let's say, what's that? That's about 70 centimeters across. Yeah is accessible for the vast majority of even super fat people. Well, and also, like, that sh thing should be considered holistically. The reason that the fucking park bench has the fucking no sleepy th thing comes from the same instinct, right? Like, it's... It's a... Yes, it's intended to be a barrier to use. Yeah, hmm. absolutely. <laughs> it's just a barrier to use based on class right. rather <laughs> than size. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, but obviously class and um, and fatness obviously have some interaction. Oh boy, is this an intersectional model. Yes, <laughs> we, don't, we, we do not need to rehash all of our various problems with the way that the world is constructed, but anyone who's listened to this podcast knows all the ways that we could launch into a... Yeah, I mean, there is a class analysis that could be done here. Right, and again, I will limit myself to just saying, again, if you are of a certain class where your ability to access foods that are dense enough in nutrition that you do not have to eat so much of it that you end up becoming fatter than you might otherwise be. Food not. deserts are a form of class warfare. Right, How about exactly. That? Yeah. But also, I will explicitly say that class interacts very distinctly with these forms of discrimination as well. And I don't just mean in the sense... <laughs> Dude is being climbed on by a cat. <laughs> and I don't just mean in the sense that if you are wealthier, you are more likely to have access to personal trainers and nutrition and good food and all this sort of stuff. Although you are. Although you are. But also that the experience of somebody who is a, a large fat person, let's say, who is poor is radically different to the experience of a large fat person who is rich. Well, they make it very obvious with plane seats, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, first class is comfortable. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right? But not just that. I mean, if you look at Gina Reinhardt, right? I, just based on the photos that I've seen, I would say she's probably a large fat person. But I very much doubt that her day-to-day -day life is limited in many of the ways that large fat people typically experience because of being large fat. That class aspect of this is very, very important as soon as you come to talk about the kind of structural discrimination that this categorization system is intended to capture. And that's fundamentally what this is about. 
This is a system of classification that is intended to make unavoidable the fact that there are structures of discrimination based on body size, and fatness specifically, although they often impact people whose bodies are larger as a result of other reasons. This classification is not going to show up in like the American Medical Association's publications or whatever else, but it is extremely powerful as a tool for describing human experience and human health as well, because you can talk about those structures of access to medical care, you can talk about the physiological reality of being extremely fat in a way in this that is not at all captured by BMI and such. I mean, Whereas BMI it has the aura of respectability because it is it's a number. number. It's measurable. <laughs> right. This is actually far more practical yes. in terms of as a... As a tool to talk about the reality of fatness. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, this cannot directly relate to BMI because BMI is a fucked up metric. But realistically... I reckon about here is where you would get to the class three obesity. And as pointed out, you as a mid fat person have a vastly different experience from super large fat and super fat people. Right. Yeah. And this ability to talk about gradation of discrimination and degradation of barriers to life among different scales of fatness is so important. And it's something that I have never seen well encompassed in any medical literature because for one, most medical research excludes fat people to start with. And for two, if you are explicitly doing research on fat people, it's typically of the form of, oh my god, fat people are going to die. And so all fat people tend to get lumped together. This might be too personal or Not whatever, but I wanted to ask you, Tess, part of the job of a statistician is categorization. But those categorizations, once they leak out, can often be used violently. Yes. And do you ever think about that in your own work? Um, so in relation to these categories specifically or broadly? No, what, what you do as a statistician. More broadly, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, absolutely. I have not been really involved in anything that would lead to the constructions of categories like this. But I look at things like... Well, we've talked about race. You look at anything to do with AI that relies on categorization data, which is an awful lot of it, particularly if it has anything to do with social data, all of these things can become violent when they are used to oppress people. And often they are, particularly when it comes to categories related to forms of discrimination and, and power. I might answer this one for Tess, or at least uh, suggest an answer, and Tess can say if it's appropriate. In the course of helping a friend with a question about how to measure work outcomes, mm. Tess was extremely forceful about making sure that what was being measured could not be turned to the purposes of surveillance or further exploitation, even if it may have provided you know, a direct benefit. The statistician may have liked to have this data. Mm. But Tess was very keen to say, no, we won't use this as an access because in irresponsible hands, the collection of this data can be used to do violence. So I would say, if Tess is happy to accept my judgment, that she's very aware of this and does make sure that sometimes Pandora's box should stay fucking shut. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. And, and like, I look at any of the, the research that I do, and I am conscious of this. I think everybody who does statistics in these sorts of spaces responsibly is. Sometimes that means you don't measure something. It's very, very difficult difficult to restrict who sees stuff. So often what you do is if you measure it, you make sure that that data is secure. The tools that you use to measure stuff are very, very difficult to keep shut, I guess. If you are building a system of measurement, and I haven't had much to do with actually building these sorts of systems, anybody I talk to about it, I do emphasize that these considerations must be taken. You can choose to build your system in a way that minimizes the opportunity for that to happen. I don't think it's possible to completely exclude it because the tool that measures discrimination is a tool that can be used to reinforce it. Yeah. It's, it's really a question of what, what other structures are there around the measurement instrument that limit how it can be used and who, who has control over that measurement instrument. This can mean everything from who can actually see what is being measured and I, on the whole, think transparency is better with that sort of thing, to once it is measured, how is it used? And like in BMI stuff, I think the difference that you see between the BMI categories and, and the categories of, of like health, if you will, that, are, that come out of that, and these categories constructed by fat people for fat people, is that these are constructed to make obvious systems of discrimination. So they are very transparent. They are kind of self-assigned 
Like I said, oh, I reckon Jana Reinhardt's probably a large fat, but that's not something I would say is an absolute measurement of her experience, right? Certainly. They are transparent. They are chosen by the people to whom they are apply. It is used to make clear where structures of discrimination happen. If you were somebody looking to persecute fat people, you could absolutely use these categories. Yeah. You probably wouldn't because you would probably construct something that's not so quite so representative of their individual experience. Sure. But you could say everybody mid fat and above has to do these things. Yeah, yeah. But that's not how it's used in practice, right? No, no. So I hope that answers your question. No, no, it certainly does. I was just, I always think about it because like I'm a Marxist, obviously, but I read a lot of postmodern novels and sort of that sort of thing, which is like the idea is that abstraction in and of itself is like violence kind of like flowing on from that if you know mm. what i mean and the more abstractions you make the more like systems of power that are enforced even unnecessarily or whatever i always think about that and especially like in something like statistics yeah where absolutely it's a field where it is about categorization that is purely abstractions yes <laughs> yeah yeah like- <laughs> well I-, I look at this sort of thing right and i think this is an abstraction. This is a less, I think, an abstraction than the BMI thing. Yeah. Because the BMI thing is removed from what's how it's actually used in regards to fatness. This is not. Yeah. Uh, so this is very explicitly about fatness, but it is an abstraction in the sense that there are different experiences encoded within it. Where I think that you can lose the empowerment here is if you only think about it in isolation. Yeah. So if you only look at fatness as a form of discrimination, you have fucked up. Yeah. So you have to make it more complex. You incorporate other systems of power in order to really maintain that relevance and maintain that aspect of human experience. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Any time, well, because we're explicitly talking about structures of power and discrimination, right? Yeah. But any time you build a, a statistical instrument, and this is a system of classification that is a statistical instrument, you need to think about this sort of thing. What Dean referred to in terms of me talking to a friend about who works in HR, and she had been asked to build KPIs yeah. for a bunch of people. If you start from the standpoint of how will this be used as violence? With KPIs, somebody's going to lose their job over it. With categories of fatness, somebody is going to be exposed to discrimination or otherwise like treated differently as a result of them. Somebody may be exposed to literal violence, but you can then choose whether or not the, the category is intended to represent the violence that they are already exposed to, or whether it is going to become an avenue for that exposure. Yeah. All right. That is a very long podcast episode, Bart. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, as ever, for having me. Yeah. And uh, to the listener, once again, I will advertise our Patreon, patreon.com slash statistically insignificant. If you want to hear more about the intersection of statistical objects and power, there's a lot of material on there as well. Dean has already disappeared, so I don't need to thank him. And I'll see you next time. It's been a while since up like my twitter so uh oh, yeah. at snitch and orwell with no g in the middle there as soon as blue sky opens up to the public i'm gonna move over there obviously but like yep. for the moment that's where we are see you later have a good one